Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Central Kentucky Federal Society chapter. Uh, this is our first meeting of 2021 after a brief hiatus, and we're excited to get going again. Uh, we have a, a great program set for uh, set forth for the dit for today. And uh, but before moving into that, I do want to note this is not the only event on the calendar. Uh, to give you a bit of a tease, we, we have several. Uh, several events in the pipeline, including one that we're tentatively planning for the week of February 12th. Um, and I guess I can go ahead and say we're, we're eyeing February 12th itself for an event with our friend Paul Salamanca, who has a new presentation that's near and dear to his heart, and he's going to share that with us. And uh, I'd also like to add that now that it appears to uh, the, the tide appears to have turned a bit on the vaccination, as Gandalf might say. Um, we're planning on doing this in person, if at all possible, and, and we're, we're ironing out those details right now. So stay tuned um, for more information about that. But today, for today's business, we are honored to host Attorney General Daniel Cameron and Solicitor General Chad Meredith to discuss Chad's new role and what this means and what the heck is a Solicitor General. And uh, so I'll start by giving a little bit of background on both of them. Uh, Daniel Cameron is an Elizabethtown, Kentucky native, a graduate of John Harden High School. Uh, he attended the University of Louisville and following a distinguished college football career, moved on to the Louisville Brandeis School of Law. Following graduation, he completed a federal clerkship and became legal counsel for Senator Mitch McConnell, where he assisted uh, the majority leader in a number of important legislative items, including the successful confirmation of conservative federal judges, including Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch. Um, following his time in DC, he came back to us in Kentucky and joined law the law practice at Frost Brown Todd in Louisville and was elected as Kentucky's attorney general in 2019. Uh, Chad Meredith is a Litchfield, Kentucky native, uh, earned his, who in, earned his undergraduate degree from Washington and Lee University and his law degree from the University of Kentucky College of Law, graduating summa cum laude from both. Uh, upon graduation from law school, Mr. Meredith completed his federal judicial clerkship with Judge John Rogers of U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and then Judge Amaltha Parr for at the time, the U.S. District Court of Eastern, uh, the Eastern District of Kentucky. Um, following that uh, experience, he has an extensive private practice background, both, both at Frost Brown Todd in Lexington and with the firm Ransdell and Roach PLLC, where he developed an extensive experience in appellate advocacy. Um, over the last few years, he has been serving in state government first as deputy general counsel for Governor Matt Bevin and since his election in 2019 as solicitor general to attorney general Daniel Cameron. So thank you both for joining us today to discuss this new office and and what this means. So I, I, I'll let you both elaborate that on your own. But the first question, Mr. Attorney General, do we really need more generals in Kentucky? <laughs> well, I, mine is uh, is, is strictly uh, a a uh, I don't know if it's it's probably fair to to use that term. I, I I still like to be called by my first name, so Tom, feel free to use it. I uh, uh, that's uh, don't know necessarily if I live up to uh, uh, that uh, not that honorific, if you will. So I'm uh, I'm Daniel for this conversation and. My mom still calls me Daniel, uh, and my wife calls me Daniel, so uh, that, that, that suits me just fine. Good deal, good deal. Well, can you tell us a little bit about the decision to create this office, and, and what were the, the motivating factors in, from your end? Yeah, well, look, let me first say that I appreciate the opportunity to, to be with uh, members of, of the Federalist Society, obviously. Uh, having been a member and, and certainly have uh, values aligned with, with this organization, I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you all today and to just share some insights uh, into sort of our office and, 
how the role of SG came about. I know Chad is obviously excited to be here uh, as well. And it is exciting to hear uh, and certainly grateful that you all are contemplating uh, moving back into in-person meetings. We've been in sort of the midst of some really challenging times because of COVID-19. Um, I'm grateful that we have a vaccine in place or, or, or multiple <clears throat> vaccines in place uh, that allow for us to return to some level of normalcy. It's unfortunate that it's taken a while to get there, but uh, I am glad to, to hear that you all, and as well as other organizations, are starting to, to contemplate moving back into to in-person to your question about how this office uh, came about, Tom, I think I've shared with you and, and maybe others that are, are listening right now, and Chad certainly knows this, that uh, really for me, I, I, had, I was working in Senator McConnell's office and moved, moved back to Kentucky in June of 2017. And one of the first big uh, events uh, when I was coming back was the statewide, and I think for the first time, statewide chapter event for the Federal Society that was held here at the Capitol. I know Chad and Matt Kuhn and Carmine and April Winberg and others were, were very, um, uh, or were instrumental in getting that uh, arranged and, and having that event occur. And one of the speakers uh, at that, that conference-wide or statewide uh, conference uh, was Elbert Lind. A lot of you all will know that uh, Elbert was uh, the Solicitor General in West Virginia, um, and now works at a, a, a pretty large uh, law firm. But it struck me to hear him talk about the role that the SG plays in really, and Chad will allude to this or talk about this as well, uh, of giving a state uh, a unified voice as it speaks to uh, higher courts, not only in the respective state that the Solicitor General sits in, but also in uh, higher appellate courts across the country, and ultimately the highest court, the United States Supreme Court. And so that really uh, uh, sat with me and, and struck me that we didn't have uh, that individual or that operation in Kentucky. And so I said at that moment, uh, and of course, this was before I even really thought about running for attorney general, I said, if the opportunity ever presented itself uh, for me to be in the AG's office here in the Commonwealth, uh, I'm gonna advocate for that position. And lo and behold, uh, at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, uh, I decided to, to run for attorney general and say, well, I've got a platform during a uh, months long campaign to talk about some priorities. And, and the SG uh, uh, point doesn't really sell much on a campaign trail, if you can believe it or not, uh, but it did mean something to me, and, and I know folks that are, are listening and watching now, uh, just in terms of the importance uh, that an SG's shop can have in really uh, emphasizing the importance of appellate practice. Uh, in my judgment, Kentucky's appellate practice, uh, as far back as, as this office has, has been in existence here in Kentucky, uh, has sort of been piecemeal. There's not been a unified voice uh, the emphasis uh, and the importance hadn't really been placed on appellate practice in Kentucky uh, out of the uh, attorney general's shop. And so it was really important for me to make sure that we brought in really talented folks to work with the talented people that were already in the office, uh, but really joining those energies and joining that intellect and strength, combining all of those talents that we had in the office uh, again, to speak with a unified vo voice, to speak strongly with our appellate branches here in Kentucky, but also uh, to be a good neighbor and a good partner to our surrounding uh, states uh, and as well in speaking to the Supreme Court. And so uh, that was the genesis for the SG shop. Uh, I'll let uh, Chad speak about it from his perspective, since he was one of the reasons Elbert Lynn ended up coming in uh, to Kentucky. Sure. And, and Thanks, before, General. Appreciate that. Chad, I do have one housekeeping note, I failed to mention at the start of this, uh, we are going to open this up for questions uh, later on in the programming. And I just wanted to remind everybody, if you have any questions for, for either of our guests today, please uh, enter those questions in the Q&A function of the Zoom meeting, but the chat is disabled. Uh, so if you post something there, it will be lost to time. So uh, 
we'll, no one will ever see it. So uh, please go ahead, Chad. And I actually have a similar question uh, along those lines. I know you served in a similar role in the Bevan administration. And I was wondering, and, and, and jumping on to what Daniel said, if you could say how this is different or, or the, the structure behind this component sure. of the Solicitor General's office. Sure, yeah, thank, thanks for that, Tom. And um, before I get to that, I wanna say uh, thank you to you and to the Federal Society uh, for hosting this event. Uh, Federal Society is just one of my favorite organizations uh, ever. Uh, I love uh, everything the Federal Society does, and it's just uh, such an honor and a joy for me to uh, be involved in, in this forum. So thank you, and thank you also to General Cameron for uh, inviting me to share the stage with him here. And uh, um, this is this is a lot of fun for me. And I, I look through the list of attendees here, and I see a whole lot of friends and, and former coworkers and some great people there. So thank you all for being here. Uh, you know, I was thrilled in 2019 to hear General Cameron talk about his plans to to create a Solicitor General's office, and I was even more thrilled when he asked me to assume that role. And it's something that I've long thought Kentucky needs. When I got out of law school, uh, I started my legal career by clerking for Judge John Rogers and Judge Multipar, the two best federal judges in the country, in my opinion. I'm probably a little biased. Um, but in those roles, um, I got to, especially at the Sixth Circuit, I got to see uh, advocates from, from other state governments around the circuit, Tennessee, Ohio, Michigan, and as well as Kentucky. And, and it occurred to me that in the states where they had a solicitor general, there seemed to be um, kind of some, a unified voice speaking for that state and um, some outstanding quality control. And, and uh, it struck me that it was really something that Kentucky needed. And so ever since I clerked, I've, I've long hoped that Kentucky would create this position and, and General Cameron did, and I'm grateful that he did. And so I think it's something that was a long time coming. I think we were maybe the 41st or 42nd state to have an SG's office. A couple more have been created since then. So I think um, something on the order of maybe 44 or 45 states have an SG's office now. Um, this is something that's really gained uh, ahead of steam in the last 20 years. You know, 30 years ago, it was almost unheard of. Not many states had it. It kind of started to grow in the 90s, um, essentially um, po popularized by um, Judge Jeff Sutton's work as the Solicitor General in Ohio. Um, so after people saw what he was able to accomplish in Ohio, I think a lot of states saw the wisdom in creating this position. And so when I worked in the previous governor's office, um, we kind of wanted to implement a lot of the reasons you would have this position in, in that portion of the executive branch, because in, in Kentucky, um, executive branch legal representation is, is somewhat divided. In, in some states, the AG's office does all of the legal representation for every office and, and, and every division of state government. And that's not entirely true in Kentucky because um, oftentimes cabinets and departments appoint their own attorneys uh, and they represent that cabinet and that department in litigation. Uh, so, in, in the previous administration, we wanted to kind of bring um, a unifying force to all of the arguments that are being made on behalf of those um, executive branch agencies. We wanted to have one person who speaks uh, for those agencies and for the executive branch in appellate matters. And why is that? Well, it's a lot of the same reasons that General Cameron wanted to create this position, because it helps to have one person you can see the whole playing field and see the big picture who is, is representing your views in appellate courts. Because appellate courts, the decisions that appellate courts make often have profound impact on policy because they can, they can either open or foreclose avenues um, for, um, for policy proposals going forward. So it's helpful to have a person in those positions who, um, who can think doctrinally and think about how you want the law to develop and think about where policy might, might need to go in the future. So that's, that's kind of why we created that position in the previous administration, but it's hampered in, in, to the extent that the lawyers appointed by the governor can't necessarily appear anytime the Commonwealth has an interest. What's great about the Attorney General's office and what makes my position now really more of what I think of as a true Solicitor General's position is the Attorney General has authority by statute for either himself or his appointees to appear in any matter uh, in which the Commonwealth is interested and the attorney general gets served anytime there is a constitutional challenge to a Kentucky statute. 
So it gives the attorney general a much broader platform uh, to appear and represent the Commonwealth's interests. Okay, okay, well, great. Uh, a follow up to that, Chad. Now, is this office of the solicitor general codified in the statute or is this just simply an appointed position? It's, it's both. It's codified now. General Cameron, um, uh, he, he'll probably want to speak to this more, but he created the position by executive order uh, when he was uh, first sworn in. And, and then over the course of the next legislative session, the legislature codified it. Yeah, if I can, Tom, just just briefly, um, you know, one of the things you you I was new to, to state government. Uh, and so one of the things you, you recognize pretty early on is uh, that you got to get buy in from the General Assembly and from legislators. Uh, and so there was a little bit of a honeymoon period, right? Because this was the first time that uh, an AG aligned, I think, with the General Assembly, the House and the Senate was was in this office. And so they, they wanted to be helpful. And again, it's not something that, that is a, a big selling point during a campaign, but was really important to the institutional structure of this office to make sure that we were, again, not to not to sound cliche at this point, but really were speaking with one unified voice. And so having uh, an SG was really important to me, really important to bringing over Chad and, and having Matt Kuhn come on, come along as well. And so the first step was to uh, uh, draft and execute this executive order uh, so that we could implement and get the ball rolling on the front end, but knew that ultimately this would have to be codified in statute. And much in the way that it's not a, a real strong selling point on the, the campaign trail, it required a little bit of an educational uh, uh, or an education of our, our members of the General Assembly because, you know, frankly, people were asking, well, what is this? How is this different? Uh, and so myself and, and Barry Dunn, our Deputy Attorney General, and, and Chad and, and Matt and others really had to go and, and talk to our General Assembly about, uh, we don't want you to just give us this because this is a honeymoon period and you want to help this office out. We want to make sure you're aware uh, of the significant advantage that this gives us in terms of our practice here, not only in Kentucky, but also uh, in uh, states surrounding Kentucky. For instance, when I go to conferences now or have conversations with folks uh, from across the country, uh, you know, they talk about some of the, the work that we've been doing in other facets. Uh, but what they really hone in on and focus on, and I think what we are trying to build a little bit of muscle memory on, uh, is our appellate branch, is our appellate practice here uh, that's led by Chad and, and, and Matt Coon very admirably. Uh, those are the things that, that people, I think, in the legal uh, world care about, is how is your appellate practice stacking up against other states? How is your appellate practice uh, and how are you viewed uh, in terms of the judges in your respective circuit? Uh, or circuits outside of, of, of the Sixth Circuit, uh, and how are you viewed in front of the United States Supreme Court? It was important to me, and again, I think it was important to Chad, to make sure that we had a strong foundation, strong bones, build this SG practice, make it as robust as possible. Uh, we still got some work to do. I mean, obviously, we can talk about uh, you know wanting to bring in more people, staffing, and that sort of thing, but I really do think uh, we are uh, putting, uh, setting the right steps in terms of uh, getting this uh, practice off the ground and, and making sure that we are being known as a strong uh, intellectual uh, group that can hold our weight against really anybody in the country. You raise a couple of, of interesting points. Uh, you, you've spoken, both of you have spoken quite a bit about a unified voice uh, on legal issues for the state. And, and you just mentioned divided government. Um, we find ourselves in a strange situation here, uh, at least to Republicans or, or conservatives, that there is divided government in the executive branch. Now, there have been a couple of instances, but largely over the last 100 years or so, that, that hasn't been the case. So when it comes to crafting a unified legal position, you know, is there any coordination with the governor who, as we are all familiar, have his, has his own attorneys? <laughs> and uh, have there been points of agreement in crafting the state's legal policy? Um, well, I mean, it, 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 there's no secret that there have been a few uh, 
differences of opinion on on some things that have been been happening. I blame that largely on Chad. He's the one that uh, <laughs> leads us in, that leads us into those uh, into those conversations. But um, I think traditionally um, the AG has functioned as the representative of the state in the legal capacity. Uh, I, I think by and large. Um, when you, you get into a, uh, a philosophy that is based around political affiliation, you start to, to see some of that friction uh, when my predecessor, then uh, Attorney General this year, uh, was in this office and you had a, a governor of a different political philosophy. Um, and obviously some of that continues now, but what I, what I have tried to, and I hope people that are watching now um, can respect is that whenever we've made a decision uh, to be involved uh, uh, in any sort of legal conversation, and I, I use the the phrase legal conversation because uh, you know I uh, as litigants I think the process itself is adversarial. So in order to dial that back, sometimes I I, I refer to it as a conversation, uh, be, uh, but but I I I hope people recognize that we become or I've tried to be very deliberate in any uh, litigation or, or conversation that we've gotten involved in, whether it be here in Franklin Circuit Court or whether it be in our, in our federal district and uh, uh, circuit courts uh, here in the Sixth Circuit. So um, these are, again, deliberate and very thorough conversations. And I imagine Chad can, can speak to this as well. We don't rush into anything. It's simply based on the law and our interpretation of the law. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, our political philosophies. In fact, I, I think I've, I've been hit from, from the right and the left uh, because I've either moved too, too fast uh, to challenge the governor or I've moved too slow to challenge the governor. Uh, what I really do believe, and, and I know I see if, you know, Corey Skolnick and, 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 and Russell and, and Bill Rapaski and others know that when, when I set out on this journey uh, to run for attorney general, when you obviously you have to have a perspective and priorities when you run for this office. Um, but the decisions that we make once you're in office, you cast aside uh, sort of the political philosophies and just do what is right by the law. And whether that is looking at the KRS, our Kentucky revised statutes, what's passed by the General Assembly, looking at our Kentucky constitution or our, our federal constitution, that is what guides those are our North Stars in this office. That's what guides the decision-making process. Again, it's very deliberate, but those are the things that guide the decision-making process that comes out of this office. And, and Chad is aligned with that uh, view and perspective. And yes, there is gonna be friction in government. There is gonna be friction based on uh, the, the interpretations that you take looking at the exact same text and, and what that text affords and say a governor or affords a legislature. Uh, and, but I frankly believe that these conversations are important because it establishes uh, precedent that can be used going forward, uh, allows for people to get a better understanding, more clarification uh, about how, uh, say, we're supposed to operate in the midst of a pandemic, how we're supposed to treat uh, our, our, our industries here in the Commonwealth, how we're supposed to treat religious institutions how do we move forward in terms of schooling, whether that be a public or private institution? So these are questions of great concern and great interest. And so although there was some friction in the midst of it, I'm glad that we had these conversations. I wished in some instances, uh, some of those decisions would have turned out differently, but it was important that we had that conversation. Uh, and I think it will help us in terms of moving forward, uh, in terms of the legal conversations we have moving forward in Kentucky. Yeah, and Tom, if I could just pitch in, I'd like to say that one of, one of the things that I'm most um, proud of about this office is, is the way, the very principled way in which General Cameron has made decisions and led us based on legal doctrine and legal principles. And, and he's not made decisions, and this office has not made decisions on um, the basis of ad hoc judgments or arbitrary judgments or policy preferences. General Cameron has bought, brought a very strong um, philosophy to this office of simply following the law and interpreting and enforcing the law faithfully. And 
Uh, Tom, I view my job, essentially, I view my most important job as being um, an instrument in protecting the rule of law. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, the, the fundamental notion of the rule of law is that the law is something that exists separate and apart from the will and preferences of those who interpret it and enforce it. And so I view the biggest part of my job as being finding ways to advocate in appellate courts for decisions that are going to be doctrinally sound and they're going to comport with the text and original public meaning of our Constitution. And, and I think General Cameron has done a phenomenal job of creating an atmosphere in this Commonwealth where we are actually paying attention to the rule of law and actually paying attention to, to matters other than policy preferences and uh, arbitrary or ad hoc desires about what result we want in a particular case. And, and I think that's, that is an essential element of the rule of law and an essential element of a, of a free society. Great. Uh, to, to shift gears a little bit, uh, you know, back to the, the formation of this office, uh, could either of you comment on any issues or, or difficulties or, or roadblocks you faced in, in getting this shop going? Um, and, and related to that, are there any notable victories or defeats over the last 12 to 18 months that you'd like to talk about? Well, uh, on the, uh, the difficulties and ch challenges uh, uh, question, uh, I, I wouldn't say uh, just because of, um, you know, I spoke a little bit about this honeymoon period. I wouldn't say that there were, were challenges in terms of getting it off the ground. Obviously, uh, from a personnel standpoint, you want to make sure that you bring in um, really talented and, and bright folks uh, to lead this office and, and help improve upon uh, the systems that are already in place, but really um, make uh, the entirety of our appellate practice um, just as strong as we possibly could. And so again, that meant bringing in Chad, that meant bringing in uh, Matt Kuhn and, and uh, Brett uh, Nolan as well. And, and we're gonna continue to, to build out. I'm, I'm really excited about uh, uh, a, a young woman that we're, we're going to have coming in uh, at the uh, in, in, towards the end of the summer. She's going to be coming in from a clerkship, and, and there'll be others that are, are going to be a part of this uh, this group as we we build out um, over the course of this year. Uh, but one of the things that I, I think I, I spoke about a little bit was just educating the legislature on what the SG shop is. Chad's right in the sense that. Uh, roughly 40 states or so had an SG. We were one of the few that didn't have an SG. And so it was unfamiliar territory, unfamiliar ground uh, to folks here in our, our legislature just because they hadn't heard uh, the term Solicitor General before and, and didn't know what that meant. But once we educated them on this is really uh, to give Kentucky a seat at the table in terms of the national legal conversation, uh, but also to make sure that we've got strong leadership in our appellate branch that we're, we're, we're placing needed and, and, and the, the, the necessary emphasis on this branch uh, so that we can Im improve the appellate practice here in Kentucky and, and that uh, the perception is, is that this, this branch is on the move and that we're getting stronger and stronger every day. Uh, that this wasn't a power grab in, in any sense, that we weren't trying to expand the power or authority of the uh, Attorney General's office, but simply wanting to codify in statute uh, the importance of appellate practice in the Commonwealth and the importance of it uh, to all 120 counties. And so from that standpoint, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the challenge was just making sure uh, that we were, we were educating folks. Chad, I don't know if you want to add on that front. I, I cannot improve on that, General. Okay, well, I guess let's talk about Kentucky's Solicitor General's office in particular in relation to other states. Is there a particular state that, that you see as a model that, that you're, you're aiming to replicate here in Kentucky or, or the federal Solicitor General's office or or, or is there any type of comparison between what we do and what other states do? 
Yeah, General, I'm happy to take this one if, if you'd like. Um, yeah, Tom, you know, I, I speak frequently, almost daily, with counterparts from different states. Um, so I'm, you know, constantly talking to them about what they do and how they do it and what their offices look like. And there are some essential elements of an SG's office that are pretty consistent, you know, across the country. Uh, the main one being that uh, state SGs in every state that I'm aware of will take the helm of any significant appeal. Uh, now, you know, once you get beyond that, it varies a little bit. In some states, they exist only to um, take over the most significant appeals. They don't really get involved in more mundane matters. Uh, in some states, SGs are in charge of running all litigation, not just appellate litigation, involving constitutional matters or matters of federalism. Uh, you know, in some states, they only run civil litigation, not criminal litigation. In some states, they also have responsibility for overseeing the office's uh, attorney general's opinions or um, FOIA or open records opinions. So, so the duties vary from state to state. But the way we're trying to, I wouldn't say necessarily there is one state that we're using as a model. Uh, we're looking at a lot of different states or over like last year, we've looked at a lot of different states and uh, to, to see how other states have done it and what works and what doesn't work. And the way we've set up our office is, um, essentially, RSG's office is in charge of all civil and all criminal appeals uh, in the state. So we have a division uh, of criminal appeals with a deputy solicitor general who is in charge of that division. He has roughly 20 to two dozen attorneys, uh, assistant attorneys general underneath him, who uh, are responsible for litigating all of the criminal appeals in the Commonwealth. And that, that includes habeas cases, as well as direct appeals and collateral attacks on judgments. And then we have a civil appeal division as well uh, that is currently headed by Brett Nolan. And uh, Jeff Cross is the criminal appeals uh, deputy. And so anything that is on appeal involving the Commonwealth is gonna be within the purview of the SG's office. Um, now we might pull in people from maybe the, the civil trial division to help out on some branches or on some cases because we don't necessarily have, you know, dozens of lawyers in the SG's office like other states like Texas might have. So when the workload gets really heavy, we might pull people in to help out with, with discrete tasks. But in general, we, we have established the parameters of the office as encompassing any appeal in any civil or, or criminal matter. And um, Tom, if, if I may, um, Chad, which is, is um, symbolic of, of his personality, uh, is, is modest in, in terms of uh, this conversation. Um, I will just, uh, just mention again, or reiterate the point that I made earlier, which is that when I go out and I'm at conferences, uh, people are talking about Chad Meredith, and people are talking about Matt Kuhn and Jeff Cross and and in large part, it's because for so long, uh, Kentucky in many ways um, sat on the sidelines in terms of these big national conversations and, and the, the appellate practice in this country. Uh, and I am, and I don't, I'm not kidding when I say um, at least once a week, uh, either Chad or, or Matt or, or Brett or, or Jeff are coming into the office and saying, hey, Arkansas wants us to lead on this, or uh, South Carolina wants us to lead on this. Georgia would like for us to lead on this. Uh, so and so is asking for our opinion or views on this, uh, and so you know there, there's a little bit of uh, reservation or, or or worry whenever you try to create or develop a new branch or you rebrand it, if you will. Um, but I haven't had any of that angst or any of that concern. Uh, because I know uh, with Chad and, and the others that I've mentioned uh, that uh, we are now part of that national conversation. And when I say we, I don't mean the, just the AG's office. I mean Kentucky as, as a commonwealth is a part of the national conversation on a whole host of legal issues. You asked earlier uh, about any wins or losses. Um, you know, obviously we've had uh, mixed results um, in terms of, uh, you know, wins and losses, if you will, but what I think is important about the conversation that we had last year about the extent of executive power in the midst of a pandemic, uh, what impact or effect 
does that have on constitutional rights as it relates to religious institutions? Whether we won or lost, being a part of that conversation, having the muscle memory that we now have, uh, being participants in the Sixth Circuit uh, and the United States Supreme Court where uh, uh, we've, we've had some opportunity to, to, to brief there, um, it, it really does say a lot about the, um, the abilities of the folks that we have here now that are, again, they, they represent the AG's office, but they also represent Kentucky, Kentucky more broadly. And I hope um, that you know that they are doing it, uh, that they're representing you well, uh, and that they're representing you um, uh, with great uh, distinction. So I, I appreciate and I cannot say enough about the, uh, the work that they're doing. Well, let's talk a little bit about these national legal conversations and these larger joint operations with other states. You know, how do you all reach the decision as to whether to join in any of these lawsuits uh, as either uh, lead parties or, or friends of the court or, uh, you know, have other states joined us in our in our own independent legal ventures over the last year or so? Hey, Chad, if you like. Sure. Um, well, Tom, it varies from case to case. You know, we've, there are, this arises in a number of contexts. Uh, probably the most common context is when a state drafts what we call a multi-state amicus brief and circulates to other states. And you often see this arise in situations where there is an issue of common concern in either the U.S. Supreme Court or in one of the uh, U.S. Uh, courts of appeals. Uh, for instance, maybe there is um, a question about, um, you know, the constitutionality of a state statute that is that is a statute that is common among states. You know, for instance, Matt Coon is getting ready to argue in just a few minutes uh, a case at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit about the constitutionality of some of our um, consumer protection laws. And as you would imagine, I think probably all 50 states have some form of a consumer protection law. So yeah, that was uh, that was an issue of great concern to a lot of states. So the state of Illinois um, volunteered to write an amicus brief, a multi-state amicus brief supporting us in that case. So states are states follow these issues. And whenever they see an issue uh, that is of concern to them, they consult with other states and, and kind of develop a game plan about how they might want to go about writing an amicus brief. And states often approach us and say, hey, we've got this issue. Do you think you guys might be interested in writing a brief to help us out on this. And, and, and likewise, we do the same with other states. And so when those come, if, you know, if we write them, we did 14 of these, I think, last calendar year, um, which to my knowledge, I'm not aware this office had ever done one of those in the past. Maybe it had, but I'm not aware of it. We did 14. We we're very proud of that. And we had a lot of uh, states join uh, all of those uh, 14 briefs. And so, but when those come into us from other states, you know, we read them, we talk about them. Um, and, you know, if it's if it if the brief is doctrinally sound, if it's an issue that's a concern to us, then we join. Um, you know, there might be any number of reasons why we might not want to join a brief. Um, and just like there might be any number of reasons other than the quality of the brief that, that you know, people might not want to join ours. So that, that's one context when this arises. You know, the other context is when a state is actually filing a multi-state lawsuit. Um, and those arise from time to time. You know, sometimes um, a state is suing the federal government or a federal agency. You know, sometimes um, states are suing other states. Um, you know, it, it occasionally happens that um, some states will band together um, to sue. I think right now, I think Montana and Wyoming are suing the state of Washington in an original action in the U.S. Supreme Court. We actually filed an amicus brief on that last year. Um, so, so these lawsuits pop up, whether it's against the federal government, whether it's against another state, you know, they pop up from time to time. And if, if we, we take largely the same approach to that, if, if it's an issue that is of interest to the Commonwealth and it's something, uh, that, um, that aligns with General Cameron's views and, uh, aligns with the platform uh, on which the, uh, people of the Commonwealth of Kentucky elected him to represent, uh, then we take a deeper look at it. And, you know, if it's something that we are very interested in and think we can um, play a positive role in, then we, we get involved in those. Well, one last thing before I open this up 
uh, for questions from our participants. Uh, I'm gonna direct this primarily to the Attorney General, but, but Chad, please feel free to add your thoughts as well. So I know this is a relatively new office and, and you guys are really just getting going, but what is the goal or vision for the Kentucky Solicitor General's office in the future? Are there new things that you want to do that, that you aren't able to do now or, or that you plan to do? Well, um, Tom, I kind of referenced or alluded to this a little bit earlier, which is that uh, I, I want this to be a, a premier branch of uh, the Kentucky AG's office. And the reason I want it um, to be such a strong unit here uh, is just because of the uh, ramifications of and the impact of appellate practice. And you can see whether it's stuff that we're doing here in Kentucky or, or things that are happening in other states. Um, there is great interest in the decision making that happens in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, all of our courts of appeal, uh, but also the United States Supreme Court. And I think it's important for Kentucky, again, to have a seat at the table. Uh, I want people to know that, that we are we're ready and willing and uh, want to be an active participant in these conversations. And so that's my vision. Uh, obviously, I can't stay um, in this office forever, um, but it's important that we leave a lasting legacy of, of strong and, 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 and very solid appellate practice here um, and, and for others to build upon uh, in the generations to come. This is largely about attracting talent and, and building the talent that we already have internally. And, and you know, I wanna make sure that you know, folks know that uh, it really is about building up the folks that we have here in the office. And that's why I've been grateful for, for Chad and, and Matt and Jeff and the interest that they've taken in existing uh, folks on our team uh, to, again, just make sure that we are doing everything we possibly can to elevate that practice. But it's also about uh, bringing in uh, really talented uh, lawyers, whether they having just come out of private practice or having just found themselves um, leaving a, a clerkship uh, we want to bring in the best and brightest and, and folks that have an interest in public service. Cause look, I, I'm the first one to tell you that we can't pay you what, you know, uh, you know, they can pay you at, uh, you know, some of the firms here in town. And I've had conversations with a lot of you all uh, about that exact point, but I hope that, you know, that we are, are building something special here, uh, that we're building something that will have lasting impact. Uh, and so, it's much more about um, making sure that there is a lasting legacy here in this office of strong uh, appellate practice like I began. And, and that's largely because of, of, making, you know, of making sure we have good folks like Chad and, and Matt and Jeff Cross and Brett and the list goes on and on. But uh, uh, it is a, a really solid team and, and I'm proud of the work they're doing. Yeah, thank you, General. I, I can't say it any better than that. Uh, I'll, I'll just add that, you know, I want us to, as we continue to staff up and bring on an excellent team, uh, I want us to stay hungry and keep striving for excellence. You know, I think General Cameron has done a phenomenal job of putting in place here a culture of excellence where everyone um, strives for perfection and is not satisfied with, with perfection if we ever attain it. Uh, we want to keep going above and beyond um, all previous accomplishments and, and, you know, I, I want us to make sure that, um, that we can implement General Cameron's vision in all things. I want us to continue being a national leader uh, in, in multi-state actions, multi-state amicus briefs. Uh, and, you know, I want us to, to get to the point where this office has the respect and gravitas where it's essentially, you know, not just, not just by statute, but also in, in popular understanding, the, the Kentucky analog of the U.S. Solicitor General's office. You know, I would love if we got to the point where uh, the Kentucky Supreme Court started calling for the views of this office, like the U.S. Supreme Court does with the U.S. Solicitor General's office. Um, so, um, you know, that, those are kind of the big picture, long term uh, visions that I think we have. OK, great. Well, we have a few questions already. And, and just as a reminder, uh, if you have any questions for either of our guests, uh, please register those in the Q&A box and, uh, and I will get to those in turn. Uh, 
The first question that, that I see here, that there's two that, that seem to touch kind of on the same topic as to who appoints the solicitor general and how and under what conditions he or she is removed. And the related question is, would the next AG automatically appoint a new SG? Well, um, the SG here um, is essentially an at-will employee. And so um, they are, they, they, they serve, um, um, I guess, at the pleasure of, of the AG. And so um, we have, again, I, I, I brought in Chad uh, because of obviously our existing friendship, but I knew that he was going to be uh, a strong solicitor general. And so um, they are by appointment and uh, I guess um, they could be relieved of that position at any point by the uh, attorney general. I can't tell you what a, um, uh, any successors in this office might do. Um, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue to have, you know, Chad talked about the responsibility of, of making sure that we defend and, and advocate and promote the rule of law. Uh, my, my hope is that whomever uh, sits in this office um, continues to strive to do that and brings in people that will align themselves with that view uh, and that, that mission. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, we, we, we intend to be here for a while, uh, and, uh, but uh, hopeful that any successors would, would be aligned with that viewpoint. Okay, okay. Uh, the, the next question here, John Scheller asks, is there any coordination between the AG and the governor's council, and could you explain why or why not? This was touched on a little bit uh, earlier, but... Um, I just want to see if there's anything either of you wanted to add to that. Yeah, per, uh, periodically our offices are in contact, whether it be um, uh, at my level um, uh, with conversations with the governor or with uh, other folks within when that within that office. And again, we're we're going to have disagreements on on uh, when we look at the exact same text, and that's okay. And uh, that's a, a healthy part of, of of our system of government and uh, how our adversarial process works in terms of uh, of, of of litigation. Uh, but what I, I hope people take from part of what they take from this conversation is that any of the decisions that we've made uh, over the course of of 2020 or are now moving into 21 aren't made with any animus. I've said this from the very beginning uh, that I certainly respect the the role and the responsibility that uh, then President Trump, now President Biden, um, our uh, Governor Bashir, our, our, our judge executives, our mayors have to play in terms of making sure people stay healthy uh, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, but we've got an equally important responsibility to make sure that we are respecting the constitutional rights of our citizens. And so, um, you know, I'm reminded that then General Barr uh, said at one point, uh, during the uh, the pandemic, that even in the midst of a pandemic, the Constitution cannot be suspended. And I know Justice Gorsuch and others have have given si similar uh, uh, riffs on that that statement. Uh, and so it's important that we strike the right balance here in Kentucky. I think we've been trying to do that over the course of 2020, and, and continue to want to do that in 2021. Uh, but again, I stress the point that these decisions are made with no animus. They're made deliberately. They're made based on law uh, and in our view of that law. And we go into court and we try to argue that position. And a win, lose, or draw, we come out and shake hands. And, and I, I hope that's the attitude that as we move further and further into this year that we can take on a whole host of, of issues in government and, and in policymaking. Um, and we try to make sure that we reflect that here in this office. On a, on a similar note, uh, another participant asked, is it the proper role of the Attorney General's office to say take sides in separation of powers disputes between the three branches? And if so, how do you determine which sides take? 
Well, let me, um, so from, from my perspective, and I, I think, I, I hope I did a good job of articulating this during the run-up to the, the, the opportunity to serve in this role, is that I firmly believe that the uh, Attorney General should be in the responsible fit position of defending um, the, the measures and, and bills that are, are passed out of the General <clears throat> Assembly and, um, you know, ultimately, that is the responsibility that I view that the Attorney General has, and I believe that's set out in the authorizing statute for the Attorney General's office, KRS 15. In addition to that, uh, and I think, uh, although he's on the a different side uh, of the uh, of the equation now, I think you saw this with then my predecessor, then Attorney General Bashir, uh, is that he also he ultimately looks at the Constitution, he looks at our statutes, he looks at the Kentucky Constitution and makes a determination along with his team uh, as to whether uh, the decisions that are made by the executive branch are uh, wed to and align with our Constitution and our statutes. We have undertaken a very similar process uh, in, in, in our time in this, this office. Uh, and again, it's made based on great deliberation. And so I think it's an important part and a healthy part uh, of democracy, but also um, our, uh, our adversarial uh, system that we have here to make sure that we're routinely doing this and to make sure that we have clarification on any issues uh, of great magnitude and scope. And so when, what you saw in 2020 was our uh, responsibility to do that. Um, uh, I think we did it the right way. I know some people uh, might have disagreed with it, um, but, but ultimately those decisions or, or those determinations and conclusions or judgments are made by a court. Uh, and those matters have been resolved. We continue to be vigilant in terms of our priority and responsibility to look out for the constitutional rights of our citizens. Uh, and uh, and uh, it is appropriate for us to dispense with that responsibility. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tom, and, uh, question, sorry, Cameron, ahead, Tom, can I just add a couple that, that um, Chairman Cameron's question or answer was, was perfect. Um, and I just want to add a couple things to come at it from um, not a different angle, but an additional angle. Uh, you know, former 10th Circuit judge, now Professor Michael McConnell, wrote a really interesting essay on the U.S. Solicitor General's office, you know, probably 30 something years ago. And uh, I think a lot of what he says applies to this office as well. <clears throat> and he points out in that essay, the importance of preserving, the importance of the SG's office in playing a role in preserving the separation of powers. And, and I think that is one of the key points of what this office and the AG's office does. And what I mean by that is, it, you know, we, our highest duty of fidelity is to the constitution. And the separation of powers in our constitution is one of the most essential and, and, and key elements of liberty protection in that document. And so we have to stay in our constitutional lane. And, and what that means is it's not our job to second guess the policy decisions of policymakers. But when those policy decisions transgress a line that is pretty clear in the Constitution, it's our duty as constitutional officers who, who, took, a, who took an oath to uphold the Constitution to, to protect the Constitution, protect the rule of law. So for instance, if the legislature passes a statute that General Cameron doesn't like, he doesn't really have the prerogative to, to take a dive on it and say, no, nah, I, I don't like that law. So if somebody sues, I'm just not going to defend it. You know, that's, that's just not how this works. It's, if you do that, then, then you're essentially trampling on the separation of powers. You're allowing an executive branch official to become a policymaker. And that's not our job. It's, it's our duty to the extent that we can do so ethically to, to defend statutes and to defend policies that, you know, when we can do so uh, consistent with our ethical duties as attorneys, it, we're not policymakers, we're, we're executive branch officials. Um, and, and likewise, um, you know, when it's, it's, it's simply our duty to, to protect the, uh, the uh, separation of powers when we can. Great. I know we're running short on time, but it, it looks like there may be one or two questions left that I think we can tackle pretty quickly. Um, this first one, uh, I think pro probably is best directed at Chad. Um, 
Britton Craggs asks, are you considering joining any of the current lawsuits being brought by other states against the Biden administration? And if so, are, are there any particular ones uh, you'd like to mention? Uh, well, hello, I'd like to say hello to my good friend, Brenton. Uh, it's been a while since we've talked. I miss talking to you. Maybe I'll give you a call this afternoon. Uh, thank you for that question. You know, we, without getting into specifics about any particular um, lawsuit, uh, you know, I'll just say that, you know, consistent with what I said earlier about evaluating lawsuits that come in, states are frequently um, drafting complaints and um, considering filing them and, and thinking about whether certain federal actions are constitutional, whether they violate principles of federalism. And, and these are issues that are central to, of central concern to states. And so we get a lot of um, phone calls, a lot of contacts from uh, counterparts in other states uh, about these issues. And when they call us, you know, we uh, we're happy to talk to them, hear them out. And, and we, uh, consider we consider those potential lawsuits and, and we take them under advisement and um, you know as those pop up we we think deeply about them okay it, it looks like the last question here from from mason hill uh, asks you mentioned staffing and attracting talent being a priority in the solicitor general's office but what about the other divisions of the attorney general's office is that the same policy Oh, absolutely. I mean, we are uh, always uh, in need of, of, of talent. And in fact, part of um, um, the request that we've made to the General Assembly is for an increase in our budget. Again, we know that we're trying to compete against um, uh, some really high caliber uh, law firms that in, in try to attract the very same people and understand that we'll never get to that same uh, pay point. But but we're we're always hopeful and optimistic that people will We'll look at this office and see that the uh, the, the the service to uh, the Commonwealth and uh, in good of the the public interest uh, is a is a strong selling point. Uh, but yes, we're we're I'm always uh, looking for 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 folks that uh, want to come to the AG's office. So please send us your resumes, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be seeing you in here soon. Great. Well, thank you both for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to, to host you guys for an event, and, and hopefully we'll see you all soon. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Okay. And just one there final reminder before we go. Next event coming up week of April 12th, hopefully in person uh, with, our, with our good friend Paul Salamanca. So we hope to see everybody there in person next month. <laughs>